Hi, welcome along to a very special video here on my channel. It's nothing to do with playing the saxophone. It's one in a series of videos that I've done about warfare in Europe. Um, I kind of got bitten by the bug about 18 months ago. I made you a, a series of videos that you can watch up here uh, about three men who didn't return back from Europe in the 1914 to 1918 conflict. This video is about a man who did come back and a man I knew very, very well, my grandpa. And here he is with uh, myself, my dad and Amy, four generations of foreshores all together at one point. I think this was taken in 2009. Now there are a couple of reasons why this video has been delayed. I wanted to get it out for you in June, but we were holding back a little bit because we hoped that my auntie might be able to find some tapes of my grandpa telling you these stories. It would have been great to have heard his voice on this video. Sadly, we weren't able to locate those. We think he may have actually written down uh, the stories about his war rather than actually have spoken them into the dictaphone. And as some of you know, there's been some quite um, difficult circumstances for me to deal with uh, in my family life uh, since the summer, which has meant that this has been delayed. And I was kind of trying to think of an appropriate time for me to put this video out and I don't I think Remembrance Sunday is a very poignant time to do it and a very important time to do it not necessarily for grandpa himself but for the friends and colleagues that he lost in the Second World War 75 years ago uh, this year since the D-Day landing 75 years ago coming up since the Battle of the Bulge and the final push uh, to defeat Nazi Germany uh, by the Allied forces so I'm going to take you back to June, take you back to Sword Beach, Lounge sur Mer in Normandy and uh, back to some rather warmer temperatures. Welcome to Sword Beach in Normandy in France. 75 years ago this very afternoon, you have to use your imagination to picture it, but this coastline would have been filled full of military vehicles, ships carrying all sorts of different supplies. On one of those landing ships was my grandpa. He was driving his truck off the beach into the wash, into the actual surf of the tide onto this beach, off the beach, into a field. Those trucks that Grandpa drove off here onto Saw Beach were part of 177,000 vehicles that the Allies managed to land between D-Day and the 27th of June. A remarkable number of men had landed and it was the biggest invasion force in history. But like all of these stories, they only really, for me, come to life when you hear the personal stories. Now, Grandpa would have always said he wasn't at the sharp end of the battle. In fact, it's a good job to a certain extent that he wasn't. He nearly ended up there though, and we'll find out more about that later on in his story. As I arrived here at the beach this afternoon, I really felt the words of Barack Obama, who on the 70th anniversary of D-Day, he said some words that really chime with me. As I was landing on Marine One, I told my staff, I don't think there's a time where I miss my grandfather more, where I, I'd be more happy to have him here. Than, than this day. So we have to tell their stories for them. We have to do our best to uphold in our own lives the values that they were prepared to die for. Rookville, as far as I'm concerned from now on. This was the place 75 years ago tonight that uh, Grandpa came and drove his truck to after he'd driven off the beach at Saw Beach, followed that route that I've just shown you. And he says in his uh, autobiography, following the map references given to us, I led a few of the lads off the beach at Leon sur Mer and through Corelli, following unit signs to a place called Rookville, a farm and a few houses. And from what I've just seen and what I've driven around it, it's basically that today as well. Uh, we were parked around a field under trees, under camouflage nets, and had to dig our own trenches before we were given anything to eat. 
It was getting late and dark and when the last of the lads arrived, bringing Captain Roper with them. His Jeep was the only, he's talking about his CO here, Captain Roper, his Jeep was the only vehicle which failed to drive through the surf. He and his Batman hadn't waterproofed it well enough. Consequently, he had to wait for the Jeep to be towed out and all his kit was soaked and he looked in a sorry state. His tent was put up but whilst he was drying out and having a drink in the pitch black, a late arrival in a lorry ran over his tent and all his dried kit. It wasn't surprising that by the end of that week he had been sent home, his nerves in tatters. Every night we crawled into our slit trenches under the trucks because of the shrapnel coming down from an AA barrage put up by the Navy just near this village. Not many planes came over but they became a nuisance rather than a danger. One thing that's mentioned in a lot of history about the Battle of Normandy is the Bocage. These kind of high rise, although I don't think this is a superb example of them, but these high rising hedgerows that basically very very easy for defenders to hide into very easy to hide a tiger tank the other side of it and ambush ambush sorry people coming down the other side of it um, it's the first it's certainly higher than anything we get in England and proves such a killer uh, such an amazing defensive tool for the Germans but such a killer to the British and Allied troops that were coming down here <laughs> At this point I don't think the story kind of gels too well so I thought I'd come back and tell you a little bit more about the story. So Grandpa had landed in Normandy on the 27th of June, they set up shop at Roqueville as you saw and then they uh, moved further down, further south into a place called Adru where they were supplying the 59th Division which was attacking the city of Caen. Now if you know anything about Second World War history you know that Caen took an awful long time to fall partly through some strategic errors by the Allies, some type people would argue and historians would argue that there was different tactics involved. Anyway, the facts were that um, sadly Grandpa's division was wiped out towards the end of July, beginning of August, and his unit was going to be disbanded. Uh, that basically meant that everyone who was doing different jobs, Grandpa was in logistics, were going to be put into frontline infantry. Now Grandpa, whilst he'd been trained as a soldier, he'd spent the previous three years learning how to do logistics rather than fighting as a soldier, and there were a fair chance that him and his friends probably wouldn't have got through the first set of battle, they wouldn't have had the training, they would have been cannon fodder to a certain extent. I myself, my dad, his sister, my auntie, my brother and sister and my children probably owe our lives to the decisions of uh, my grandpa's CO who basically made the decision of rather than disbanding the unit and sending it back to uh, turn them into infantry soldiers that they were going to be turned into a unit that would keep the 1st Polish Armoured Division supplied. The 1st Polish Armoured Division uh, liberated Ypres uh, in Belgium which you can watch in a vlog that I did up here and I'm going to take you back now to France uh, to fill, continue the story uh, as we journey into Belgium and Holland. So Grandpa along with the rest of his unit had to basically make transit trips from the beaches at Normandy at Aramange where the big Mulberry Harbours were. Um, we had, they had to drive from there all the way up to the front lines in Belgium and Holland and one of the things that Grandpa recalls is driving down this very road from uh, Albert uh, to Cambrai and uh, through that kind of way and this is the Somme battlefields of the First World War and he comments on the number of First World War cemeteries that he can see and I'm right by one here the Perone Road Cemetery all of these ones left behind after the Battle of the Somme and you know now I'm here it's a hundred years later since these battles and they're very poignant to me what they must have been to Grandpa a young man of 19 20 he was the same age as maybe like me it didn't have as much effect until he was older but I'm sure it must have done I'm sure there must have been some thoughts about how here they were again his generation having to go and his generation they deserve our admiration because they fixed a place so that it didn't happen again in Europe anyway um, and you have to remember that if you want to really understand the Second World War, you have to understand the First World War. You have to understand how it happened, how the world changed during that period, and how the things that weren't fixed during the, at the end of the First World War needed to be fixed at the end of the Second. And Grandpa's generation, they did a very good job, didn't they, with the formation of the United Nations, with NATO. Uh, with all those all those things and we could get into lots and lots of history but we're going to drive down to Cambrai where um, Grandpa has a very good story about one particular return journey from Belgium from near Brussels going back to Normandy.
So I was hoping I'd get Grandpa to tell you this, but sadly we haven't been able to locate the tape of him telling this story. But he says, uh, um, eventually I stopped in the main square in Cambrai where I realised I was in the American army sector. His truck had been losing water, as I said, it came down here into Cambrai. And that was it. So that evening, in this car park, he made a little meal on the top of his petrol cooker and bedded down in the back of the truck. But he was woken by the starter motor in the truck whirring away and realised that someone was in the cab. As I put on my boots and jumped off the back of the truck, the engine started and the truck started to move away. The night before, I didn't think the truck would have even started the state it was in. Anyway, I climbed back into the cab, opened the door and pulled on the handbrake to stop the truck. The handbrake on these trucks was not on the left as is normal, so I was quite fortunate. In the cab were three American soldiers, well sloshed, who no doubt would have stolen my truck. After a long argument as to why the engine was shot and the realisation that I couldn't get rid of them, I agreed to drive them to the camp where they said they could get the engine repaired the next day, because the truck was a V8 Ford and America made Ford, therefore they'd have definitely have the parts for it. They didn't know which road to take out of the square, and we spent quite a while trying to find the correct one. All this in the pitch black of night with two small thin beams of light from the truck's blacked out headlamps. Eventually, after an hour, we split it to their camp, and it turned out to be an aerodrome. I parked up, got rid of them, and bedded down again. So it took me about eight and a half minutes to get here, uh, to what is now um, a Cambrai something aerodrome, um, but at the time it was an American airbase. Admittedly, I wasn't driving a truck with a broken head gasket, and uh, nor did I have three drunk Americans in the car with me. Uh, but when Grandpa got here, he said he was having a fry up in his cooker the next morning. Uh, one of the people he'd uh, given a lift back to came around sober this time and took me off to his CO. He informed me after hearing my tale of woe that their engine gaskets would not fit my truck. However, he did offer to, to tow me to Amiens to our workshops. And hey presto, a large recovery truck drew up, backed up into mine, bashed in the radiator protection bar, hooked up the front with a crane and off we went. And these are Grandpa's words here. I remember the man of the time. I sat in the front between two large colour gentlemen and hung on as the truck set off for Amiens. And uh, he then uh, tells a lovely story after the truck's fixed about how he's heading back to Normandy um, and uh, picks up a, a lady with two children and puts them into the car, puts the pram into the back of the truck, uh, carries on driving. Can't go much further because of, uh, you know, obviously it's getting, you know, it's just destroyed and wasn't supposed to be taking passengers anyway. But notices that as he's going through some of the towns that the wagon is, the truck is just basically. Uh, sluggish again and he's thinking oh no not again after he's just spent all that time repairing it and uh, he then when he gets near to Carl he, t he stops the truck asks the lady he says you have to get out now goes on the back to get the pram and in the back are about 35 refugees have all hooked to lift uh, on the back of his truck and all the way back uh, into Normandy they were, they were very very grateful and then it carries on and uh, you know that that kind of commute as it were from Normandy up into Belgium and into almost the Belgian Dutch border continues. They have Operation Market Garden in September, which fails uh, in its objectives, and then basically the port of Antwerp isn't really taking supplies until kind of I think about the 25th of November 1944. So it's a long time, and there was a lot of journeys uh, that Grandpa had to make, and so did all the other people in his unit, and you know thousands of other troops in logistics. It's that ability to keep the troops supplied especially in the Second World War, which becomes a war of machines, you've got to keep your tanks supplied, you've got to keep your tanks fueled, you've got to keep your aeroplanes supplied, your aeroplanes you know, fueled and all those kind of things. And that is so, 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 so important. Um, and that is why, in a way, I'm speaking to you from this place now and the Allies won 74 years ago, but into 75 years ago, why they were so successful.
In September 1944, the Allies launched Operation Market Garden. It was a massive airborne assault upon Arnhem and Nijmegen and those kind of areas in order to try and create a massive punch through into Germany. They captured the port of Dieppe, which meant that they could get enough supplies down to have one chance, one massive thrust, and they pushed so far in such a short space of time after the broken out of Normandy that they really felt they could be in Berlin by Christmas. Sadly, Operation Market Garden was ultimately a failure, costing over 12,000 Allied lives. And I'm here on the Dutch-Belgian border in a town called Merzel de Reef, where Grandpa arrived in October 1944. Now, by the start of November 1944, the Allies had managed to capture Antwerp, which meant Grandpa didn't have that massive commute, uh, go, you know, 300 miles one way, 300 miles back the other way, from the front lines to the Normandy beaches. Not only was that a very long drive and a very costly drive in terms of manpower, it of course was burning a huge amount of fuel. And some historians reckon that the Allies were burning through at least a third of their fuel just having to go from one port to the next. So here in October 44, Grandpa arrived. It was the place where he spent the longest in his Second World War. So here is a picture of him outside uh, this building, which was the, the village cafe then. Uh, it's been since sold and turned into blocks of flats, but uh, I reckon Grandpa had a great time here. In fact, I was trying to ask my dad, you know, why, what was it so special about here? We've got so many photographs, uh, as I'm showing you now, of Grandpa being in this village. And it was ultimately where he spent the most time, uh, where they struck up friendships, some more than others, uh, and they, they just, integrated with the locals. I'll tell you his story now. He says, um, during October we moved up through Belgium to a little town called Merzel Dreef. It was on the border with Holland near Turnout. In fact, the border post was a small hut at the top end of a single road that ran through the village. There was a large Catholic church, a school and about 50 houses plus a couple of cafes come bars. We were given shelter in the church hall as the winter set in and the primary school was being used by orphan children from Antwerp so they became great friends with us. The winter was very, very cold but we set up shop and kept supplying the tanks. The Polish tank crews were very friendly and quite appreciative of our support. We were a few miles south of Breda in Holland, which we visited a few times when we were off duty. The Dutch people were almost starving and having had the worst of the German occupation for so long. This prompted a lad called Ron Darby to raid a field full of potatoes outside of this village, loaded them onto a truck and took them over the border to give to the Dutch people. Over the river at Breda, the area was still occupied by Germans who had a V1 site. From there they were launching the bombs onto Antwerp and the V2 rockets to London. The V1 bombs were just rising after the launching as they passed over the village and it was disconcerting at times as they were liable to wander off course. We spent Christmas 44 in the village but a month later we packed up and moved on ready to cross the river Rhine via Nijmegen. The move was anything but easy as we had to get through the Reichsfeld forest, the scene of vicious battles and terrible casualties often in mud a foot deep. You see the, the letters Café in Holland, uh -huh. Jochem's? Yes, Jochem's, yeah, yeah. That's his next door, yes, yeah, so that is um, this one here, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> But yeah, the other, yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, uh... yeah. It says he 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 remembered. This was this was he must be eighty. He's an old, very old man now. Uh... Uh. As I come to the end of my film here in Merzel de Reef, Grandpa's war did not end here. He carried on. He went uh, into uh, Holland and then into northern Germany, ending the war in May 1945 at Wilhelmshaven, which is a North Sea port. There in Wilhelmshaven, the first Polish armour division of which Grandpa was attached to, they took over three cruisers, 18 submarines, 205 minor battleships and support vessels, 94 fortress guns, 159 field guns, 560 machine guns, 40,000 rifles, a quarter of a million, over of a quarter of a million artillery shells and enough supplies of food to feed 50,000 troops for a six month period. And I've no doubt being in the logistics that was, Grandpa would have had a great deal to do with sorting that out. In September 1945, four months after the war ended, Grandpa eventually got some home leave, some 14 months after he'd first set foot on, in European soil. He went back through Europe onto a ferry back to uh, Dover and then travelled up to Blackpool where he surprised my grandma and proposed to her while he was home. He then had to immediately leave and go out to uh, the Middle East where he spent until February 1947 in Egypt. Now sadly I can't go out there and make a film in Egypt at the moment, it's not the easiest place to make a film, quite dangerous at the moment, uh, but I'd love to go out there because my other grandfather, my granddad Eastwood, he spent his war in the Royal Air Force in Egypt and you know he was uh, servicing and keeping aircraft going and played another vital role. 
Now, 14 years ago, on the 60th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, the BBC asked veterans if they'd come forward and tell their stories. We tried to encourage Grandpa to do the same thing, but he said, no, I didn't want to do that. I didn't really, I wasn't at the sharp end, he would often say. As children, my auntie likes to recall the story on Boxing Day when we used to go, go around to Grandma and Grandpa's house and we'd asked our dads, we were playing with a fort, me and my cousin, and one of us said to our dad, what did you do in the war, Dad? And, well, I wasn't in the war, but asked Grandpa. What did you do in the war, Grandpa? I drove a truck. Well, Grandpa, you did a lot more than drive a truck. You were part of an effort that did win the war. It was logistics that enabled, it was the, able, the ability to be able to keep their supply lines open and keep their supply lines moving. The ingenuity, the hard work of people like Grandpa that enabled the Allies to win the Second World War and to rid the world of the evil tyranny of Nazism. The fascism that led people to concentration camps, the millions of people killed through hatred. It's been an amazing privilege to do this video. As I said at the start of the film, the men whose story I told of the First World War were always just history. They were men, pictures in history books, men who I never got to meet, whose stories I could only relay from, you know, field diaries and everything else like that. This is a very real story of a man who was very, very real to me. And I'm sure there are more stories out there, so please tell their stories, tell your family's stories. We can't allow the stories to always remain hidden. The stories need telling because they're great stories, but also because of what they represent. And I've said this in many of my films, my father and I never had to fight a war in Europe, unlike my grandpa and his dad. And I pray that my son will never have to do that either. So thank you very, very much for watching. Thank you to everyone who's helped make this film happen. Well, thank you most of all to Grandpa. And as I'll say for the third time in this film, Grandpa, I wish you were here and I miss you on days like today.